Welcome to the Loins of History. My name is Colin and I'm joined by my co-host Jay. And here at the Loins of History, we're going to connect the events of the past to the events of today. If you remember last from last week's episode on Chinese-U.S. relations, we talked at length about containment and where containment all began, and especially around the U.S. and China. And before that, we got into the loss of China. So really, we're, we're in this period of the 1950s. And within containment, the U.S policy with against the Soviet Union and, and the People's Republic of China was to contain communism and prevent the spread of it. And for today's episode, we're going to apply that to Taiwan. And Taiwan has been a, a flashpoint of Chinese and US relations over the past 70 years, really since the end of the Chinese Civil War. And what we're going to talk about today specifically is some of these incidents and crisis within the Strait of Taiwan. Now, the US very nearly went to war with China over Taiwan. And we're going to take a look at some of the effects, the lasting effects that has occurred because of those policy decisions made by Eisenhower and Secretary of State Dulles, as well as the the Seventh Fleet that was stationed there. So really exciting episode, going to cover a lot of history that I really didn't know a lot about, but you know, it was a great research topic. And I think it's very applicable today, especially with some of the reports on uh, war games that have come out regarding a possible Chinese invasion of Taiwan in 2026, which we'll cover. And we use that as the connection point between some of these previous crises and what might happen today if China ever did decide to invade Taiwan. So with that being said, Jay, can you give us a just a quick synopsis and talk us through what the, the first crisis of the Taiwan Strait was? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, Colin, for that introduction. So we've got one key takeaway for this episode, and that key takeaway is U.S. policy beginning in 1950 was to defend Taiwan militarily in the same way that we defended South Korea during the Korean War. So a lot of times I've, I have friends in, in here in the United States that there's a lot of confusion any time a government official, you know, President Biden has remarked on on I think at least two or three different occasions about defending a random island in the East and South China Sea and it's like why is the United States talking about you know potentially going to war over the seemingly random island that we have seemingly no actual interest in or, or well, why it was here. such such a big deal that Nancy Pelosi took a flight into Taiwan, why that was such a, a hot topic and why That's you know, right. I think the Chinese military was even on on alert at that point to try and intimidate the US. That's right. You know, why doesn't the United States care about Madagascar? <laughs> That's an even bigger island. They don't produce of- semiconductors and microchips. Uh- that's right. There's plenty of reasons why, folks, and we're going to talk about it here on the Lots of History. Um, and yeah, so there is there's a ton of history between Taiwan, China, and the United States. So really, up until this point, you know, this is episode 13 in our U.S. and China relations series, and. We've been focusing on a lot of history between China and the U.S. Taiwan, this this seemingly random island off the off the coast, has not played a major role in in, in the history between China and the United States until now. So our key takeaway here is really just trying to say, like Americans, generally speaking, know about the Korean War. If you live in a half half halfway distant or halfway decent high school district you you probably heard about the Korean War you may not know anything about it I, I suspect however the majority of people that listen to this podcast are history nerds so so you guys probably know a lot more <laughs> than the average American about the Korean War but the key takeaways intended hey this is the point in time in which the United States started caring about Taiwan and we cared about it in the same way that we cared about South Korea. Colin talked about containment in our last episode and just and, and brought it up again just now. And we absolutely were, we, the US government, were concerned about keeping communism and the CCP out of Taiwan in the same way that we were concerned about keeping the CCP or 
sorry, the DPRK, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, North Korea, out of South Korea. Yeah. And to, to your point, it's kind of interesting talking about why do we care about this seemingly unimportant island? Well, I think it was up until what the Treaty of San Francisco, where Japan ceded control or you know, nominal control is called Formosa. So it wasn't even Taiwan. It was Formosa. It was right. just an island off the coast. So Jay, can you give us a quick summary of what the first crisis, what happened during the first crisis? Yeah, absolutely. So in 1954, immediately after we sign, we, the United States and the United Nations sign an armistice with Korea uh, in North Korea and China. In 1954, late summer, the CCP starts getting squirrely. <laughs> so Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang, the KMT, had uh, retreated to the island of Taiwan. However, they still held some very tiny islands that are right up against the coast of China and still held the island of Hainan, which is the small island like right on the southern edge of of China, pretty close to Vietnam. KMT still held that island, still held several islands like along along the Chinese coast. Well, in 1954, the CCP starts getting squirrely and they start shelling one of the islands, Kinmen, that's really that's really close to China in between Taiwan and the Fujian province. And then they launched amphibious assaults on some other islands. This led to uh, limited skirmishes breaking out. And uh, due to Harry Truman's policy of, hey, we're going to defend these areas that are coming under communist attack, in 1954, Republican President Eisenhower kind of followed Truman's policy, and he ordered the U.S. Navy, the Seventh Fleet, into the Taiwan Strait. And there was a there was we had ourselves here a Mexican standoff, (laughs) and we essentially between the United States and communist China, we had pistols drawn, and we were it's like that it's like that meme in the office where like uh, Dwight. And Pam and Michael, Michael are all sitting there. Are like all like yeah, like pointing like finger guns at one another. They're not actually pointing guns. But maybe it wasn't quite that this way because we weren't pointing guns at the Taiwanese <laughs> or the KMT. But nevertheless, like we were kind of in this standoff situation. Uh well, the US in very US fashion went very high and to the right. And we, the US Joint Chiefs, recommended to President Eisenhower that we do preemptive nuclear strikes on China. <laughs> we were ready to roll. We I were ready we, to really crank this thing up a notch. <laughs> I, I think some of the hawks at the time also wanted to, quote, unleash uh, Shanghai, Shanghai Shek uh, to try and like yep, re- almost- that's right. Because their goal, it's funny, looking at the the Taiwanese, I think at the time they were like 1.3 million nationalist refugees that fled to the island of Formosa and came to Taiwan. Mm-hmm. They were out, they would have been outnumbered like 500 to one at this point. Yeah. And so like unleashing them to try and retake China would have been not a good idea. <laughs> no, that, I don't, I don't, I hate, I'm not an odds guy. I'm not a betting man, but I would not take that bet. But there were hawks right. within the administration that were like, well, we need to do cat tactical nukes and we need to unleash Chiang Kai-shek. And I think part of that was due to the fact that, like we talked about last week, we underestimated the Chinese military and we did not like – I think a lot of people saw a threat of the Chinese. So, we wanted to try and destabilize the Chinese in you know, almost a proactive, aggressive form of containment. Just my right. thought right there. Yeah, the the way that putting Seventh Fleet in the Strait was sold to the American public was because there were a lot of communist sympathizers in the United States. It wasn't it wasn't Vogue. Uh, you know, this is the height of the Red Scare. But nevertheless, there were some leftist sympathizers in the United States, and in the way that it was sold was, hey, we're keeping Mao out of Taiwan, but we're also keeping the KMT and Chiang Kai Shek out of. Uh, China as well. Like it, it felt very much like a, hey, we're just trying to keep the peace type deal. But we all knew who the aggressor was, and it wasn't Taiwan. It wasn't the KMT. So I do want to make a point about this. In 1950, 
going back to the Korean conflict, and like I just said, China got involved. China got involved essentially with a green light from Joseph Stalin and the USSR. I think we've talked about this before. Mao and Stalin were very close. They had a much tighter relationship. Uh, the USSR kind of had they had very t- close ties with China. They had a mutual agreement, a friendship, and uh, I can't remember the exact name of it, but I mentioned it last week. They had a, a pact, basically, of cooperation and mutual friendship. Um, so at this point in China, they're still kind of a new nation. They were not going to act necessarily without support from the USSR. By 1954, Joseph Stalin had died a year before, and there was actually this power mm-hmm. crisis going on in the Soviet Union for like three years, yeah. where yeah. Khrushchev was consolidated. You know, he was kind of Stalin's heir, if you will. But there was a power struggle for like three years, where him and two other. Uh, Russian, uh, excuse me, Soviet politicians, and I'll I'll look up the name in just a second because I just had this thought. They were competing for power for like three years. So, the USSR took a very passive stance in this crisis. Mm -hmm. So, they were Mm -hmm. not backing the Chinese. And as soon as the Seventh Fleet showed up and there were talks of tactical nuclear strikes, the USSR absolutely backed down and was not going to get involved or back a Chinese aggressive posture to invade Taiwan to, quote, liberate the Taiwanese. I think that's important so, to note. Well, hang on. I don't, sorry. I did. I read that they did not back down, that they like sent a statement to the US that said, if you attack China, we will get involved. Where's that at? That's, that's part of their mutual, that is part of their mutual. Yes. But they were not- At this point in time, they still had a mutual defense treaty. They did have a mutual defense treaty, but they were not going to back China's aggressive posture. Oh, yes. That's right. That's right. I guess, let me clarify that. They were not going to back a Chinese attack of Taiwan. They would back the Chinese if the US attacked. However, they were not going to get involved nor support a Chinese aggressive action like invading Taiwan. So, yeah. I think uh, Khrushchev at this point, it's interesting. We'll talk more about Khrushchev because he's going to come into play with some of these, with his relationship with Mao and some of his, the way he handled some of these crises. But I think he viewed it as a, he was more of a de-escalationist if you read on about him. And I don't think he or the Soviet Union really supported this, nor did they want to get into a war because China wanted to have Taiwan. That I guess that's that's how I should clarify it. Yeah, and even Winston Churchill, yeah, he contacted was absolutely the against it. U.S. and was like, "Don't use nukes." <laughs> so, yeah, there was there was a bunch of third parties that were trying to tell the U.S. to chill the freak out. What's funny, just anecdotally here, what's really funny is if you specifically look at the Joint Chiefs all the way up until and through the first part of Vietnam, the members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, so. For our listeners, the Joint Chiefs were the senior ranking military officials in each of the branches of the U.S. military. So Air Force was created in 47, Marine Corps, Army, Navy, and they formed the Joint Chiefs. Uh, From this time through Vietnam, they were all former World War II guys and- they're like, anytime something popped off, there are multiple different instances where when something happens, they were like, nuke them. <laughs> like, it was this very much like go to, was it Curtis LeMay was part of the Joint Chiefs during like the early 60s, getting involved in Vietnam. And there was a lot of beef between him and McNamara because it was like, hey, we need to try to, you know, keep North Vietnam from, you know, not getting too crazy. And LeMay just constantly was like, nuke him. <laughs> just nuke. It's, <laughs> it's like, it, all right, guys, chill out. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of um, George C. Scott's character on Dr. Strangelove, where he's like obsessed with a nuclear bomb and he ends up like, right, you know. I, that's kind of the image I get at this point. And I think that's what the whole like Dr. Strangelove was kind of uh, characterizing that. But yeah, and by the way, I, I had in my notes somewhere it's, so it was Khrushchev, Melenkov and Bulganin were the the three that were kind of in this little power struggle. And that's, that's a totally different topic for those, those three years succeeding Stalin. However, 
you know, just just for your own notes, it was Bohannon yeah. and, and Melenkov. Fun history fact: there was not a peaceful transfer of power <laughs> after no. Stalin's death. People people kind of underestimate that. Like they think it's like one one dictator in Russia in Soviet the Soviet Union, but that is absolutely not mm-hmm. how it happens. And there was pretty brutal repressions of like political opposition within within the USSR that oh, occurred yeah. very frequently, and we yeah. only found out about till much later. However, yeah. Anyway, so oh, there's so many there's so many comments. So I, I want to talk about how Vladimir Putin came into power, but but it's completely off topic. We need to stay and get back to China. And talk talk about chaos is a ladder. That's how he got into power. Anyway, um, that's a little uh, well, y- Peter Baelish Yeltsin, little Yeltsin, figure. Yeltsin named Putin his successor six months prior to Yeltsin actually retiring. And the reason why Yeltsin did that was because he knew that power struggles in Russia are pretty crazy. And he like was trying to preemptively like, Putin's my guy. Putin's going to be in power. Everybody chill the freak out. <laughs> well, if it's it's more interesting is how he, yeah, here, it's, it's another sidebar, but how he- We can't help ourselves. <laughs> how Putin, who went from kind of a like, I don't want to call him like a middle manager in the KGB, but he was not like this- mm-hmm supreme you know high powered executive in the private sector he was not in like a high ranking general in the military or the KGB he was only like at a equivalent of like a director level it was his time in it was his time in in St Petersburg so he was like the right hand man of the mayor of St Petersburg and he did such a good job uh Wheeling and dealing uh, be- because wheeling and dealing that was when the the Russia was you know transitioning its economy during the nineties ther- yeah they called it shock from, therapy yeah from centrally planned socialist government owned economy to private ownership well if you can imagine when you have tons of government assets if you're in any kind of position to decide who ends up becoming the private owner of all these former government assets, you have, you can make a lot of friends that way. Like, okay, Boris, you're now the owner of the lint, you know, the formerly known Leningrad steel company. Here you go, Boris. Like, and next time I want you to do something, Boris, you freaking remember how you became the owner of the Leningrad Steel Company. <laughs> By the way, a lot of them did. And that was literally how Vladimir Putin did it. I, you know, it's kind of, I just had this other thought. <laughs> we, we were getting so far off topic. Right we talk about shock therapy, you know, kind of this transition from centrally planned communism to a private capitalist economy. Well, it's kind of like a reverse great leap forward in a way, because a, a great leap forward was always packaged as this transition you know of a to an egalitarian communist society from this pre-industrial agrarian society neither of them work very well and they always have very very dire yeah. consequences we're going to get Both into of that them were terrible for their economy yeah we're going to get into that next week let's bring it back to these crisis of the, the time <laughs> let's bring it back <laughs> so jay what we talked about the first crisis can you talk about what happened afterward what the aftermath of the first crisis was yeah, and then no, good, transition good that. Thank you, thank you, Colin. <laughs> so the aftermath of this crisis was so we we were at nuclear. The U.S. was using a policy of nuclear brinkmanship to get the CCP to chill out. Well, the U.S. kind of you know it wasn't exactly a good look, but it did work. So as soon it did work in the sense that as soon as you know, this this nuclear brinkmanship was playing out, the Chinese absolutely backed down. Uh, Zhou Enlai, the, the premier, kind of like the number two guy behind Mao, he like gave this speech and he was like, hey, we don't really want to fight the United States like that. That wouldn't work out well for anybody. While like the Joint Chiefs are like, you're dang right, it ain't going to work out well for anybody. <laughs> so China backed down in... There were some, so there were two different kind of unilateral, not not treaties, but positions. So the U.S. and Taiwan signed a mutual defense treaty that lasted up until 1980, uh, by the way, but we signed a mutual defense treaty. It, it included language very similar to NATO Article 5 that basically said, if one member of this treaty gets attacked, the other one will militarily you know, respond and, and get involved. That's Article 5 for the NATO treaty. That language is included. Like we were mutual treaty allies with Mm -hmm. the KMT. It's probably also helpful to start 
to start referring to the KMT and the, and the Taiwanese as the Republic of China, the ROC, mm-hmm. only because like that's for the remainder of this podcast. We essentially begin referring to Taiwan as a separate country, as the Republic of China, in contrast to the PRC, the People's Republic of China. I'm glad you said that. Which is the communist side. Yeah, because we're not really talking about political parties. We're talking about separate countries. Well, it depends. On, they're one country. It's just who has the claim to that whole country. That. <laughs> Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Um, yeah, so go ahead. I think it's important to note, like you, you brought up NATO Article 5. We had these mutual defense acts. We had signed these with several other Asian countries around like Japan, the Philippines. We had signed several of these and we had even created, I mentioned it last week, like CATO, which is kind of this, a more or a less power, you know, a less involved NATO for uh, the Pacific the whole purpose of it was, again, going back to containment, was really to combat the Chinese in the Pacific and the spread of communism. And one of the issues and difficulties we had with it was on the European front with NATO, you had a, a definitive line. You know, you had the, the Iron Curtain and you had one real threat, the USSR. Well, here you had the Chinese, but you had all these vulnerable countries like we'll get into you know, Vietnam, you had Korea, you had some of these other countries where – Communism could break out very quickly in a revolution. So we had to think kind of strategically. Um, and I think they've, I've heard it referred to as like a hub and a spoke based on, you know, the separation of Japan being an island, Taiwan being an island, Korea being a peninsula. And they're kind of spread out over this wide area with vulnerable areas all inter- intertwined. So with this hub and spoke method and all of these mutual defense treaties that we signed, we would basically be able to react to a outbreak of quote, outbreak of communism at any given point. And a lot of that was designed around containing specifically China. So that ends the first crisis. You know, basically, Zhao Enlai says, we don't want to fight. What happens next? So after we scared the crap out of the CCP, the CCP created something called the five principles of peaceful coexistence. Uh, They took these... The origin of these five principles of peaceful coexistence, they they were first created in 1954 when the CCP was resolving border disputes with India. However, they took these principles and they applied them in 1954 to Taiwan, and then later they wrote them into the constitution of, of the PRC. So- let me let me read these five principles here because they're they're very helpful for understanding how the CCP thinks about sovereignty in their own rights today. So, uh, five principles: one, mutual respect for each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty; two, mutual non-aggression; three, mutual non-interference in each other's affairs, four, equality and cooperation for mutual benefit, and five, peaceful coexistence. So they've they later, after 194, they later wrote them into their own constitution. So China, communist China takes these five principles very seriously. Now, the reason why I'm saying they're these are applicable for today is when China talks to the U.S. about Taiwan, they refer to these five principles. One, mutual respect for each other's territorial integrity. Hey, U.S., China, or sorry, hey, U.S., Taiwan is a part of China. <laughs> you have to respect our territorial integrity. Two, mutual non-aggression. U.S., don't attack us because we are resolving an internal affair. Three, non-interference in each other's affairs. Hey, US, Taiwan is a part of China. Therefore, don't interfere in our internal affairs. You know, and four and five are, hey, we need, you know, mutual benefit and peaceful coexistence. So it's like China's smart. So what they did to kind of resolve this nuclear brinkmanship that was going on in 1954 was they were like, hey, peaceful coexistence, like we're fine. And to an, to an American, it's like, oh, cool. CCP, they're not going to attack Taiwan anymore. This is great. 
what they just did was they laid the foundation for a future like legal uh, and a talking point, a narrative that allows them to attack Taiwan. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? Like you, you said the words, like this is an internal affair. Mm -hmm. In order to enter into um, like international relations or, or two countries to have, you know, cooperation uh, relations, I'm trying to think, I'm blanking on like a technical term here, but you have to recognize the PRC as China, not the ROC. This comes into play later in, in we, we talked about, okay, well, this mutual defense agreement existed until 1980. That's the reason it stopped because it correlates to a date where we started recognizing the PRC vice the ROC. And it's important because you ha within the Chinese, you know, within what the PRC wants is you have to recognize them, their claim. If you want to enter into relations, if you want to have trade agreements, if you want to do all these things with us, you have to recognize us and our claim. Right. I don't, yeah. yeah. It's just, so this is, this is when I was doing research for this episode. This is why this kind of stuff is fascinating to me because here we are in 1954 where again, we had literally just you know, fought a war on the Korean Peninsula against the Chinese. Here we are again, one year after the armistice, nukes pointed at one another. I think, uh, Colin, don't let me don't let me tell lies, but I think China t successfully tested their first nuclear weapon. Was it was it in the late fifties or was it in the early sixties? It was it was the early sixties. But I'm glad you brought that up because one of the uh, effect or consequences of this crisis was that Mao, being very smart, Mao said, okay, we see the US has nukes and they're willing to use them on us. Mm -hmm. I want to go we fund- We don't have nukes. We do not have nuclear weapons. I want to take money and go fund it. And he used that within his party to gain support and to fund their own nuclear weapons program. And within 10 years, I assume that they had, it's a foregone conclusion that they had support from the Soviets who already had a nuke. But within 10 years of this, they were testing their own nuclear weapon. So, you know, we look at, I guess we can ask the question like, was it the right decision to send the seventh fleet? I'm going to say, yes, it was the right decision to send the seventh fleet. However, Threatening a nuclear a nuclear war over this is probably not the best decision because Mao just turned around and was like, well, yeah. they're going to use nukes. We're going to get nukes. And then suddenly now they're a nuclear power in the 60s. So that's, that's not good. But yeah. So it's, it's easy to armchair quarterback it from 70 years yeah. later. It's so easy because to be honest, I could, I could very... Knowing what we know now, knowing that the Soviet Union was there was some political turmoil, turmoil after Stalin died, and they were not they were not in the they did not have an appetite to fight the United States at this point, especially with nuclear weapons. Our nuclear weapons program was further ahead at that point. Knowing that, and knowing that the Chinese probably have, would have no answer other than just like they did in Korea, just sending swarm human waves at us. We probably could have used tactical nukes and just overthrown the Chinese. It could have worked. That's yeah, that is the most radical idea that you could have. Yeah. I definitely but don't if, think we could have overthrown the CCP. I mean, we talked about it several episodes ago. The CCP had the support of the people. Like the people wanted the CCP. And if so we detonated a nuke, probably would keep them. These <laughs> would, Americans are really evil. Their mind. But yeah, yeah, it, they'd be like, "Oh gosh, Mal, save us!" <laughs> I, yeah, I guess that's the point. It's kind of like, well, we we were threatening a full measure, but we weren't going to take it, so it it ended up long term not being. <laughs> I feel like anytime you're going to threaten a nuclear weapon, you need to be okay with the consequences of either not using it or using it. And the not using it was giving the CCP a reason to fund a nuclear weapons program and using it would be, well, we just killed millions of people and now they yeah. even hate us even more. We've proven to be the evil imperialists that they claim that we are. Yep. So, yep. Okay. So I am personally torn <laughs> on on was putting seventh fleet in the the right call the right call okay because so let's just let's let's put this in the context of two competing schools of international relations there's the realist school and there's the idealist school right the idealist school takes 
principles like like uh, sovereignty and self determination and peaceful coexistence, right? And it says, "Hey, we need to act in a way that upholds these principles, etc." That school of thought would probably say, "Yes." We need to defend Taiwan. They are their own country. Like nobody has a right to attack another country. They, like, hey, we're not going to say who is the rightful sovereign over China. We're just going to say, hey, you guys need to figure it out in a diplomatic, in a civilized fashion, not through the force of arms, right? The realist school. Could probably be broken down at least into two different schools of thought, right? The realist one realist school of thought could say, "Yes, we needed to def- defend Taiwan because the CCP is a competitor for power. The CCP is a hostile power. The CCP is not friendly to the United States. Therefore, we need to oppose them at every turn. Therefore, we should have, you know, we sh- should then and should now defend Taiwan from China. The other realist school of thought <laughs> could probably say something like, "No, we don't need to defend China or defend Taiwan. Taiwan in 1954, Taiwan was a sparsely populated island." The KMT were still fighting off tribes on the island of Taiwan. It's a, it's a fascinating aspect of, of Taiwanese history, but it, Taiwan was not this like, like it was very much the frontier. And there were like native non-Han Chinese tribes still living in, in Taiwan at this time. So it was like, this island is not in US national interest here. They were not building semiconductors at this point. Of which they are now. (laughs) They're the world's leading producer of semiconductors. Uh, It was probably the smartest thing they ever did. Uh, Anyway, the point being is that like, what would have changed in the global like geopolitical landscape if China controls Taiwan? I think there's an argument to be made in 1954, nothing would have changed. Mm. Unlike Korea, where... South Korea was a way more robust uh, economy, a way more area of strategic interest to the United States. And I think a unified communist Korea would have made things look drastically different as opposed to this massive country known as the People's Republic of China controlling an island off of its coast. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's not comparable. But yet, recalling back our first key takeaway here, the US decided to defend China in the same way that we, or sorry, the US decided to defend the KMT in Taiwan in the same way that we decided to defend South Korea. So we had a same, we had the same policy, but yet, again, from this realist school of thought, they're not the same country. They're not, it's not the same strategic interest. The communist Chinese had already taken over all of China, save this, you know, one big island off the side. Like it's not the same. Whereas in Korea, it was half the country, right? If there was this massive, if continental China itself was split into two, then yeah, then argument could be made. But like we're talking about an island off the coast. So I know that sounds really cold and heartless. This is why <laughs> I, Jay, am personally torn over over these two things because there isn't an easy answer. I think all three, the one idealist and the two different realist schools of thought, like there's compelling arguments for each of them. There's there's reasons, there's good reasons to make any of those three US policy. And it is not an easy answer on which one they should be. And we honestly, the US for the last several years, or several decades rather, has been trying to balance uh, all three of them. Jay, that's actually, uh, you're right. It's tough between those three schools of thought. I, I understand that it's, there's compelling arguments to be made on all three, but I, I guess uh, as we're, we're running on this episode, 
there was a second crisis that occurred a few years later. I know it was a little bit different. There was a heavier concentration of military force. Can you summarize that one real quick for us? And we could talk about some of the aftermath and then tie that into today. Yeah. So just to make sure that we're covering all relevant topics here, there was a second Taiwan Strait crisis in 1958. And that crisis was actually conventionally speaking a little bit more intense than the first one. So there was actually a fairly significant like air to air conflict between Taiwan, the US and China, like several dozen aircraft were shot down. We actually stationed pretty significant air assets on the island of Taiwan, both Air Force and Marine Corps uh, squadrons were put on Taiwan. First time uh, you know, we, we used the, the AIM-9 Sidewinder just as like a kind of a techno, like an air to air, an air to air missile actually. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, AIM-9 would remain in the US inventory for quite some time. <laughs> uh, but an, an AIM-9, just for our listeners, it's a, it's, you can think of it as a heat seeking missile. So that was one of the one of the first and early heat seeking missiles in in technical parlance that's an ir or an infrared missile but in in pop culture terminology it's a heat seeking missile <laughs> it's got heat seekers yeah that's, that's a yeah, that's exactly. a simple, <laughs> that's the hollywood that's, uh, version of we'll it we'll just keep it, we'll keep it at a hollywood level but yeah it, it, right. yeah with that air to air it was actually pretty decisively used because the the Taiwanese Air Force was able to use it, and they actually shot down quite a few MiGs. I think the they had a, a pretty substantial air to air kill ratio, uh, or you know, if you play Call of Duty, a kill death ratio in the air. They shot down yes. quite a few planes. However, Chinese and the Soviets were able to get a hold of an AIM nine and reverse engineered, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Well, and so what's funny is that that AIM nine, Colin, you want to tell them how they got a hold of it? <laughs> yeah, it hit a plane and it didn't blow up. <laughs> It just yeah, got stuck it got inside. Got lodged of- in the future. It got lodged in the fuselage of another <sighs> aircraft. <laughs> so it worked. So the quote heat seeking capabilities worked. It just uh, didn't detonate. Uh-huh. But yeah, can you imagine being the the dude that landed with that airplane? Like, <laughs> I imagine you know that scene in airplane where the guy's like it's just sweat pouring off of his head as he's trying to land there. <laughs> he's looking like- back like, my God, there's a missile. St- there's a missile sticking out of my fuselage. <laughs> He he is going to tell that story for as long as he lived. He's probably like, I got shot in the air by a missile and survived. Because <laughs> like, I would imagine, you know, there's an, there's an element of kinetic energy. Like when you're flying a relatively, a MiGs are not that big. They're not like 747s flying around out there. And all of a sudden this missile hits you so hard that it gets like jammed in your fuselage. Like, like that would not have been Bro, just those like missiles are traveling along. like twice as fast as the aircraft is. And the aircraft's coming close. To, the aircraft was becoming close to, to Mach one. And those missiles right. are traveling like over the sound barrier and it hits you. So yeah, the, the, the kinetic energy would be significant. And then the rattling and the, just the fact that the plane just didn't come apart is a miracle. Right. Yeah. There's so many just like, there's, that's wild. That's how they were able to to get a hold of that AIM nine is lodged in the, in the a little a little tidbit of history. But anyway, so yeah. there was. Do you just want to walk through some of the significant events of that crisis besides us losing an AIM nine and shooting down a bunch of MIGs? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it was during this crisis that the PRC actually seized Hainan, which was controlled by the KMT. Uh, Hainan is again that that small or that island that's right off the southern coast, kind of in between China and North Vietnam. Uh, Eisenhower again, you know, kind of mobilized the the military forces. We put we put a bunch of squadrons on Taiwan. The CCP shelled Kinmen again, and would continue to shell <laughs> different I love places. This. So can you, can you tell us about the shelling and the agreement was with the shelling? Yeah. So long story short, the 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 CCP and the KMT kind of arrived at this gentleman's agreement that they would continue to shell this island only on even number days. They <laughs> were very specific. Like in a very where specific those... place. 
<laughs> so like the, the cam t guys would basically like kind of go underground at a predetermined time they would shell the island and then they would come out and it'd be gravy so like nobody died as a matter of fact, I, I don't recall at what point, but the shelling, they replaced the explosives with propaganda leaflets. I can imagine like these bombs going off and it's just a bunch of leaflets. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, yeah. it's kind of a bang. <laughs> it's almost like the, you know, the gun bang. That's, yeah. that's what they're shooting yeah. at each other. And that went on until 79, I believe. I think. Yeah. This like gentleman's agreement shelling, I think it went on until 1979. So that's a long time uh, to be doing that. At the end of the day, the second Taiwan Strait crisis kind of receives less attention than the first and the third. The third would occur during the 90s, but we'll get there when we get to the 90s. Yeah, we, we <laughs> um, got a long way to go. Yeah, because there weren't really any major like policy changes that came out of the second Taiwan Strait crisis. Like we'd already we'd already signed this mutual defense treaty. We we weren't really threatening the use of nuclear weapons. Like there was a more conventional flavor to the second Taiwan Strait crisis. Um, and as I think we'll get into our next episode potentially, this is around the time when China when Mao decided to begin its Great Leap Forward. Yeah, which. Took, took a lot of internal CCP attention away from Taiwan and towards towards their own economy and how they were about to jack it up. <laughs> a, a couple of thoughts on that. Like, I think this the policy shift was less about the US, A, sending nukes, but then B, being the, the ones that were going to bear the brunt of the Chinese aggression, and it shifted to the Taiwanese. Like, at this point, the Taiwanese mm -hmm. had occupied the island for a few years, had established their own somewhat cohesive military at the time. But I think the policy shifted to the Taiwanese now are going to be able to to be a first response defense against Chinese aggression. That's why we we gave them the AIM-9. We were selling them aircraft, military aircraft that they were going to use to fight the MiGs. And obviously, they would never be able to defeat the Chinese on their own, but they would at least be able to put up a de measured defense. And that kind of became the policy forward, moving forward. Well, the mod policy policy modified to incorporate that into the strategy. Right. And then also, if you look at it, you know, the first one, the first crisis, we mentioned the Russians were very, we don't really want to go to war with the US. This time they actually backed, they took a stronger stance in a, with the Chinese and the Chinese then were emboldened because Khrushchev had solidified power. And even though he and Mao did not see eye to eye at all, as a matter of fact, that was part of Mao's purpose in going into the Great Leap Forward was actually to pass the Russian or the yeah. Soviets, excuse me, he claimed it was, we're going to catch up to Britain. We're going to pass the US. But really, it was like, we're going to be better communists than the fake communist Khrushchev and his soft policies. Yeah. So they took a, they took a more allied, ironically, that even though Mao and Khrushchev didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things, the Russian or the Soviets, I keep saying Russians, but really the Soviets were going to back the Chinese yeah, it, six of one, half dozen. The other They're still basically. Russians. <laughs> They're, yeah, they were. Russia was the dominant country within the Soviet Union. Anyway, so I felt I think that's why the Chinese felt a little bolder, and actual, uh, you know, military actions occurred in a conventional sense. So, I think the other point I would kind of bring up is obviously there's been three actual crises within the the Strait of Taiwan. This is something that's important because it's not going to go away as so long as there's a Taiwan, a, a PRC and an ROC. So long as there's two Chinas basically and not one China, this is not going to go away. It's going to resolve itself one way or another. As a matter of fact, um, the Center for Strategic, excuse me, the CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, did a war game re recently where they they took a you know they created a scenario where the Chinese and the CCP actually invaded Taiwan in the year 2026 and, you know, went through all these scenarios, I think about 24 different times. And they wanted to study what would the, you know, what would happen. And basically the Chinese would lose. However, it would be at what they called a grave cost and heavy casualties to the U S and this is all like declassified. You can go on and Google this study and it's fascinating. I recommend you do. It's about 160 pages or so of the report, but basically they find that the Taiwanese, you know, like I mentioned that the tiny Taiwanese have to bear the brunt, basically the entire defeat of China in this scenario is the entire, the entire victory conditions are predicated on the Taiwanese not immediately surrendering. 
Yeah, honest, honestly, it's um, it's kind of crazy. I I personally believe that in the same way that France was never able in a thousand years to to successfully launch a amphibious like landing on Great Britain, not since ten sixty six, and mind you, right. in ten sixty six. The Saxons were had already fought a battle against the Vikings, so they had to march, and that was in the north of England. And then they got lucky that uh, it was uh, I can't remember who the leader. Sorry, folks, it's been a while since I've studied the Battle of Hastings, but basically, the Saxon <laughs> leader took an, he took an arrow to the eye, and then the yeah. Saxons lost you know lost courage. They had already fought a battle against the Vikings, and they beat them at Stamford Bridge. Had to march all the way back across England to go meet the Normans in the south of England and fight mm-hmm. them. And it was really only because he took an arrow in the eye and died that they lost. Yeah. So it was kind of a miracle that that even happened with the Norman invasion yeah. in 1066. Yeah. Like if I was, if I was China, I would just look at the last thousand years of global history. And that is like, if it doesn't matter how strong your military power is, you have to get super lucky to do a successful amphibious assault. And if if the United States decides to get involved, it kind of doesn't even matter what that involvement looks like. You're not like you're not gonna win. The CCP is not gonna be able to successfully militarily invade Taiwan, even though it is so close to their country. People don't realize that, you know, they I've heard this. I can't remember who the original quotes are. It might be like Napoleon or something. I, I don't know. Clausewitz. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's like amateurs talk tactics. What is it? Masters talk logistics or something like that. Professionals talk yep. logistics, whatever. The ability yeah. to mass military power is incredibly difficult. And now throw in, you have to do it over overseas, which, by the way, the United States has a bigger Navy than basically everybody in the world put together. And we have better strike mm-hmm. capabilities. So, you know, if you were to cross the Strait of Taiwan, you have to get all those troops either by air, which there's air defense systems. We have a better air force. We have more missiles. We yeah. can we can send planes in from Japan. We can all over the place. Or you have to send yeah. them by boat, which are slow moving in open water. Yeah. We have a huge Navy. Yeah. And that was actually what uh, the CSIS, the, one of the things that they found was the Taiwanese just have to hold on long enough and not capitulate for the US. Basically, the US and Japan and some of their other allies like the you know, the Aussies would get involved basically to close in on the strait and start shooting. Because once they start getting involved, the Chinese, the invasion fizzles out because they just can't can't sustain operations long enough. Even if you land a half a million troops on Taiwan, which is almost yeah. as big as the whole country, if you don't have enough bullets for them to keep shooting, I'm sorry, they're going to lose. And that's kind yeah. of the, the whole point of it. Yeah, the I mean, look at why. The Germans were never able to invade um, uh, the UK during World War II. Was they ex- the Germans completely exhausted the Luftwaffe trying to gain air superiority over uh, over Great Britain because they didn't have the navy to control the channel. Uh, so the Germans tried the approach of, "Hey, let's gain air superiority." Our air superiority will keep the the Royal Navy ships away, and you know that's that's what's going to allow us to send you know limited transport ships over uh, in Operation Sea Lion. That's what the Germans called the the paper the plan to to invade the UK. They were never able to get air superiority. It was just too much. In the same way, like I think that. Is essentially the the Chinese strategy right now. If they were to take over Taiwan, because to your point, Colin, their navy is excuse me is tiny. They don't have a very robust navy. Uh, we made they a have big, some limited capabilities. Go ahead. We made it. We made a big deal about them creating an aircraft carrier. Do you know how many aircraft carriers the United States has? It's like fifteen at least. We have destroyers. Yeah, we have, and they're we have freaking ships. Freaking huge. Yeah, they're ma- they're they're floating cities. There's six thousand people on them. We have subs that are no one knows other than that sub and like three people in the Pentagon know where they're at. We have aircraft carriers. We have destroyers. Our navy is so big that like it dwarfs everything else. So yes, like we could send Seventh Fleet to the Strait of Taiwan and we would outnumber their navy basically yeah. and outgun them. And while 
China would probably be able to bomb the crap out of Taiwan easily, and that that's like high explosives are really good for destroying military equipment and personnel. They are not good for subduing a people. The U.S. figured this out in Vietnam. Well, actually, I take that back. We didn't figure it out. We should have learned that lesson <laughs> from Vietnam. Uh, should have learned German, that lesson from Iraq the, and Afghanistan. Look at the Germans in Stalingrad. That yeah, city like was you reduced can, to nothing. Yeah. If the will, of, if that people decides like you can bomb the daylights out of us and we're still not going to capitulate to you, there is nothing like you have to put troops on the ground. I, I do not believe the CCP in, in a very long time will develop the naval capacity that will allow them to put sufficient troops on the ground in Taiwan to enable them to actually like occupy Taiwan. That's just not that's not going to happen for decades. There's a there's a book I recommend to our listeners to read if you want to kind of get an idea for how the the CCP, the PRC, how they are going to fight the US. It's called Unrestricted Warfare. Uh, I want to say we we may have mentioned this a while ago, but basically they're not, they're not to your point, Jay. Building a navy takes decades. It's not something you can do overnight. You just can't. I don't care how what your national will is. You just can't. You have to build the ships, and they're very complicated. You need supply. You need a lot of things in place just to build the ship. So they're going to wage war on other fronts primarily in order to erode the capability of our U.S. Navy. So that and in unrestricted warfare, it's written by two Chinese colonels. I want to say in 1999 is when it came out. Oh yeah, uh, studying. Yeah. They basically looked at the U.S. after Desert Storm, which we've pointed back to as like the zenith of U.S. power and hegemony compared to everyone else. Yeah. The Russians, right. the Chinese look at that and they're like, okay, well, in a conventional war, there's no way we can win. How do we win? It's it's through other means. So if we're right. you know if you're worried about a invasion of Taiwan, it's very real. You need to be ready for it. However, I would expect more conflict to occur in other domains, i.e. the economy, AI, cyber, things yeah. like that, which is occurring right now. So that's another, I'm getting off on a tangent, but that's, that is no, one book no, recommendation. It's, no, it, it's actually really short too. Uh, but if I, if I was China, because on some level, I do empathize with the CCP. Like I can, like it's China. Taiwan has always been a part of China. Like I completely get they are why one people. they want. The yeah, United like States it's fought China. a war when somebody tried to leave and we brought them back yeah, in we, forcibly. Right. Like the current US policy in writing since the rapprochement during the Nixon administration in the 70s was we've articulated a one China policy. Not not going to get too far into it because we'll, well, I'm sure we'll have a whole episode or two on it when the time comes. But like we have a one China policy. So like I get it. I get why the CCP wants and considers Taiwan a part of their country. The biggest mistake that the CCP, a huge geopolitical blunder by the CCP was bringing Hong Kong peacefully back into their country and then completely crushing all opposition and dissent. Huge mistake because all you, what the CCP did when they, I mean, and they're currently like Hong Kong used to be a great place to live. It sucks now. It is not. The CCP ruined Hong Kong, uh, and all they did was they just showed the Taiwanese, look what we're going to do to you. There cannot be peaceful coexistence. What's There's a phrase. It's like one country, two administrations or something like that. They just lost that talking point. As long as, as, long as Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping is in power, no one in Taiwan believes that there will be a one country, two administrations. They just lost that talking point. Therefore, the only way Taiwan is going to become a part of China is through the use of military force. And nobody, like, they created a lose-lose situation for everybody. So, Xi, if you're listening, <laughs> which I'm, I'd actually be scared out of my mind if you were. <laughs> well, one of his but, agents is listening, don't worry. Oh, Somehow yeah. there's monitoring yeah. going on. It's like, dude, you got to like you got to cut that crap out. The if you ever want to hope for 
a unified China, you need to you need to bring back the China, like the traditional Chinese administrative position of nominal independence, and yet like like Tibet had during the Qing. It's like you're your own country, so to speak, but perform the counts out to the emperor and we're cool. Like let Taiwan have its own trade. Like figure that out. I'm I'm not smart enough to know exactly the nitty-gritty details. All I know was the crushing of opposition and dissent for Hong Kong was the wrong call and it ended any prospects of peaceful reunification. So here we are. There will be a fourth Taiwan Strait crisis. Oh, when 100%. it happens, I don't know. There, there will. And it's going to get ugly. It will. Who knows if it'll turn into a full blown war or kick off a, another international conflict, but we'll see. Jay, that was a great episode. A lot of talking points went off on a few different directions. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed the tangents. Sometimes they're, they're a lot of fun to go on, but uh, this is a great episode. And I think it, <laughs> it really tries these crises that we've talked about kind of capture the situation that has existed honestly really since the 19 since 1954 and that is a precarious piece that is held up by potential or US intervention basically and as well as their allies within the Strait of Taiwan and it has created a flashpoint in international relations between the US and China and still will into the future as we've seen with some of these war games some of the talking points coming out of the current CCP administration the Taiwanese government and the United States as well so it is going to be continue to be uh, something that is going to be covered and Jay you're right there will be a fourth one when it happens we'll see so listeners I hope, like I said, I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, please give us some feedback. We always love reading some feedback, even if it's constructive in nature. We got some constructive criticism from someone that, uh, hey, Ian, we'll try and cut back on some of the laughter a little bit. Uh, don't, we don't want to let that get in the way of the uh, the information, but uh, appreciate you. We had reading. a listener say that I cackled, which is probably true, <laughs> but it is genuine. I promise. <laughs> It, yeah, if you know, I Jay, don't feel nervous on my own podcast. I promise. <laughs> Jay and I go way back. He does like to laugh a lot. It's more, yeah. I would say, boisterous and jovial versus cackling. But anyway, you know, we do appreciate <laughs> thank, thank that. <laughs> Five star ratings are always appreciated. Helps us, helps the algorithm, helps us get the word out. Jay and I are on social media on basically any variation of Loins of History on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Give us a like and a follow. We post some updates. Just some fun pictures that kind of track along with and tidbits of information that kind of tracks along with what we're talking about within the podcast series. So, you know, give us a follow. So, and get the word out there. We appreciate the support and we'll see you next week when we talk about the great leap forward and getting into the cultural revolution in China. So that being said, have a great one.